Hello, and welcome to the solution to question number two. Question number two, dealing with two decision variable problem. The first one will be the weekly production level of space rays in dozens. And the second one will be the weekly production level of zappers in dozens. The objective function here is to maximize the profit that will be defined by eight dollars times x1 plus five dollars times x2. That's the weekly profit. Now to formulate the constraints, we need to read carefully the text and formulate one by one. So let's do it together. Here is a portion of the text that deals with the constraints. We can see that the company um, have limited resources and one of their resources is the plastic and they have only 1,000 pounds of plastic. When we keep reading we can see that for space rays we required two pounds of plastic for the production and for the zappers we required one pound of plastic. To formulate that to a constraint we need to formulate the left hand side of the constraint to represent how much plastics we actually going to use and in the right hand side of the constraint we will put our limitation. So subject to constraints here is the first one two units time two units of plastics or pounds sorry two units of pounds of plastics multiply by how many dozens of space rays so that's two times x1 plus one pound of plastic multiplied by how many dozens of zappers we will produce and these two together will add up to be uh, less or equal to the availability of the 1000 pounds of plastic. Let's proceed to the second constraint. This constraint is dealing with um, the numbers of hours of production time that are available this week. We can see that the company have 40 hours available. If you proceed with your reading, you will see that space rays require three minutes per dozen and zapper is required four minutes uh, per dozen. One of the issues that we see in this specific um, problem is that the availability of the production time given in hours and the required production time is given in minutes. We need to make sure that when we write a constraint both the right hand side and the left hand side are using the same unit. So in order to do that in this specific example, I will convert all the units to minutes. It means that the 40 hours available that we have, I will convert to 2400 um, minutes of production time available. So here is the constraint, three times x1 plus four x2, less than equal than 2400 minutes of production time. The next constraint is dealing uh, with the marketing requirement. You can see that the company total production cannot exceed 700 dozens. It means that all the dozens of dolls that they will produce need to sum to 700 or less. So that will end up to be x1 plus x2 less than equal than 700 units. The next constraint is also part of the marketing requirement and if you proceed reading you will see that the numbers of dozens of space ray cannot exceed the numbers of dozens of zappers by more than 350. If you will translate that to a constraint it will look like this x1 um, numbers of dozens of space rays cannot exceed so less than equal than the numbers of dozens of space rays x2 plus 350 units, dozen, sorry. Now in this specific format, um, this is not the appropriate format for constraints. We talked about that. Constraints need to have only constant values in the right hand side. And now we can see a variable in the right hand side. 
So the solution for this is to move x2 to the other side of the constraint, and the result will be x1 minus x2. That's an equal than 350. And that will represent the product mix that's the marketing requirement. We'll finish our constraints with the non-negativity uh, constraints. Obviously, we have to make sure that the numbers of dozens of productions will be greater or equal than zero for both uh, space rays and zappers. So now we finish the formulation um, stage of the problem. And as you can see, this is the full formulation very clear, Every, everything contained labels, um, it's very um, easy to read and understand. And the next step will be to solve and find what is the optimal solution, what is the optimal value of our profit. We will use the graphical approach, the eyes of profit line approach to complete this specific solution. So before moving to the grid, I will find a um, point on the x's to help us with um, the graphing. So here they are. We will use the x-axis for x1 and the y-axis for x2. So let's start by plotting the first constraint. It will be labeled with a green line and all the area that is below that line is the feasible area for that specific constraint. Let's add the next constraint, number two, and this is the blue line and the shaded area under that line. And as we proceed, you can start and see that when the two shaded areas are overlapped, this is um, the area um, that we have feasibility for both constraints. We will search that area later on when all constraints will be plotted. The next step is to bring um, constraint number three. Here it is, the yellow line, and the area under that is the feasible area for that constraint. And constraint number four, pay attention that this constraint have a slope, a positive slope. So the line would look like this, and the shaded area for the feasible area for that constraint is something like that, a gray area. And what we need to do um, in this step is to look carefully where all the shaded areas are overlap. And that will be our feasible area that satisfies all constraints. So if you look carefully, you'll see that it's basically represented by this purple area. That's our feasible area. We will focus to find the optimal point in one of the corner points. And in order to do that, let's label first the corner points. Here they are. And let's bring our objective function. And we'll choose an arbitrary profit. In this case, I chose $2,000. And I will plot that line to represent a profit of $2,000. Here is the line. Now, in order to maximize that profit, I will move that line parallel to itself until I reach and touch the last point, corner point, on the feasible area. So here is the first step, and here is the last step. And you can see that the last point that I can touch that will be the highest is point C. So point C is our optimal point. This is basically the stage that visually we can identify the optimal point. And what left us to do is to find the coordinates by solving the intersection point. So what we can see about point C is that it's made from the intersections of two constraints. So point C to D represent the plastic constraints, that the green line, and point B to C represent the production time constraint. So these two, if we will um, intersect between them, we'll find point C. So let's um, do some work and isolate x1 and x2 to find the coordinates, the production, the optimal point C. And here it is. We found that our optimal points x1 is 320 dozen units and x2 is 360. 
And if you substitute these two points to your objective function, you will get your, that your objective function value is $4,360. That is summarized of your solution. The next step, I would like to show you how to um, quantitatively differentiate between um, binding and non-binding constraint. So what I did here is I created a table and I will work with my constraints. So here is um, the optimal point that we found. And here is the first constraint. And what I'll do is I'll separate the constraints to left-hand side and right-hand side. I'll substitute the optimal point into the left-hand side of the constraint. And I'll check what's the value and see if there is difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So here is substituting the values. Here is the right-hand side. We can see that the left-hand side adds to 1,000. There is no uh, remaining, no slack left. It means that in the point of optimality, we have used all of our plastic resource. Constraint number two, similar approach. We'll substitute the optimal point in. This is the right-hand side. Let's solve it. We see it's 2400, so it means no slack left. It means, again, in the point of optimality, we used all the time that was available for us, the production time. Apply the same technique to constraint number three, and we'll see that on the left-hand side, um, we used 680 dozens. On the right-hand side, um, it was restricted to 700. So we have a slack of 20. In this scenario, we can see that there is a difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. We were not using or actually producing um, all the units that we could produce the 700, we just produced 680 together. We'll finish with constraint number four, similar um, application, and you can see that the left hand side, the right hand side are not the same. We have a slack. What does it mean? It means that constraint number one and constraint number two are binding constraints. Um, removing them from the problem will affect the feasible area and the point of optimality. Constraint number three and four are non-binding constraints and removing them from the problem will affect the shape of the feasible area but will not affect the optimal point and the optimal value of the objective function. This is the summary of problem number two. I hope it was useful to you. Have a great day.